Hi there and welcome to the channel of a disappointed man with me Jason Kennedy, the disappointed man. And in this video I'll be talking about Sir Walter Scott's 1820 novel Ivanhoe, which I've also christened Covid Ho because I read it while I had Covid-19 and Ivan Slow because it took me 10 days to read the last 100 pages. Now before we get on to the novel, let's have some biographical information. Walter Scott was born in Edinburgh in 1771 and he first found literary fame as a poet and he became the nation's most popular poet until in 1812 Byron published part one of Child Harold's Pilgrimage and overnight took the crown from Walter Scott who unperturbed turned his attention to novel writing and he dusted off a project he'd shelved 10 years previously and then finished it up and published it anonymously as Waverley to great acclaim. He stepped forward, revealed that he was the author and then embarked on a second career as a novelist writing historical novels, a genre of which he's regarded as the father. And he was even more successful, not just in Britain, but also on the European continent and in North America, many major writers fell under his spell and were highly influenced by him, such as Balzac and Dumas in France. So between 1812 and 1825, the money was just flowing in and Walter Scott was making thousands of times as much from his works as was his contemporary Jane Austen, for example, but in 1826, there was a terrible year for the Scottish economy and the publishing venture in which Scott had invested heavily went bankrupt and he didn't just lose everything, he incurred enormous debts and the remainder of his life was spent trying to raise money to pay off his creditors and he did this by churning out fresh works and also repackaging his earlier works in popular editions and I'll link in the description below to a fascinating article about how Scott's attempts to repair his finances helped to reshape the publishing industry. So that's the biographical sketch and now we can move on to the story and it's not easy to summarise Ivanhoe as a novel so I'm going to divide this summary into three parts. Part one, the historical setting, part two, the characters and part three the action so the historical setting for the novel is 12th century England and it's four generations or so after the Norman conquest and the displaced Saxon nobility are still simmering with resentment of having been usurped by the Norman nobles and at the start of the story the highest of the Norman nobles Prince John is scheming to lay claim to the English throne in the absence of his brother, Richard the Lionheart, who's imprisoned somewhere in Europe. Okay, so the characters, so clearly we have these two sides, the Saxons and the Normans. On the Saxon side, their leader is Cedric of Rotherwood, and he is the father of Ivanhoe. And at the beginning of the novel, he has disowned Ivanhoe because his son has become a knight, which means taking on aspects of the Norman cultural identity. So Cedric is this kind of nationalist who prides himself on his lineage. And he's also looking after Lady Rowena, who Ivanhoe is in love with. She is in love with him. And we have also Athelstan. Cedric is actually planning to marry Rowena to Athelstan because he's entertaining dreams of restoring Saxon eminence in England. We also have then Gerth and Wamba who are these lower class figures on the Saxon side and they provide some comic relief although it's up to you to judge just how funny they are. I didn't find them too amusing myself. On the Norman side they are bastards almost to a man with one notable exception that I'll come on to. Under Prince John, we have three principal nobles, Front de Boeuf, de Bracy and Brian de Gilbert. Front de Boeuf 
and Bracey are extremely flat characters. I could not remember a single fact about them after I finished Ivanhoe, but De Gilbert is fascinating. He's a Templar Knight and he falls in love with Rebecca and that forms one of the main narrative lines of Ivanhoe. Now, the only good Norman I must mention is, of course, Richard the Lionheart, who is fought alongside Ivanhoe. They are great friends. And we find out around page 50 or so that he has managed to escape from prison and slip back into England. And he spends much of the novel in disguise, only revealing himself at strategic moments. And then finally, during the climax of the novel. OK, so de Gilbert is in love with Rebecca. But who is Rebecca? The answer is she is the beautiful daughter of Isaac of York. A Jew and these two characters are despised by almost everyone else in the world of Ivanhoe except for Ivanhoe himself who does have a friendship with them and then the last group I must mention is Robin Hood and his merry men Friar Tuck and the rest of them who also play perhaps too much of a part in what follows. Now the action in Ivanhoe consists of a number of set pieces and the first of these is a two-day tournament in Ashby in the Midlands and Prince John has staged this for a political purpose. The first of these is to show the Saxons the martial prowess of the Norman Knights. Secondly, he wishes to curry favour with the Saxons before he launches his coup because he will then betray them because the reward to the people supporting him is that he is going to confiscate the remainder of the Saxon holdings and present them to his Norman confederates. The account of the two day tournament is really exciting. It's probably one of the most successful sections of the book. It's richly detailed and that just enhances the action. And at first, everything is going according to Prince John's plan. The Norman knights are sweeping all before them until the disinherited knight appears. He keeps his helmet on. It is, of course, Ivanhoe. And over the two days, he becomes the champion. On the second day, Richard the Lionheart, also in disguise, has to ride to Ivanhoe's rescue because he's been outnumbered on the field by the three nasty Norman knights and they are trying to finish him off. However, he is able to prevail and then, as a reward, he gets to choose the Queen of Love and Beauty of the tournament and he chooses Lady Rowena and then collapses. His helmet is removed and we discover his identity and his father still, his heart must be made of stone, refuses to render his son any assistance whatsoever. So Rebecca and Isaac take away the severely wounded Ivanhoe to begin tending to his injuries. In the next section, Rebecca, Isaac and the wounded Ivanhoe are on their way to York and they're abandoned by their guides in the forest. And so they link up with the Saxon party led by Cedric and pursue their path to York. However, they are intercepted by the three Norman nobles from de Berth, de Bracy and Gilbert and are taken to from de Berth's castle at Torquilstone as prisoners and there they are led off to separate parts of the castle and each has a different kind of encounter. There's one very interesting fact about this sequence. There is an old Saxon crone inside the castle and she tells her story and it emerges that she was the sexual plaything of Front de Berth Senior and when he died became the sexual plaything of Front de Berth Junior until she was too old for any more fun in the bedroom and was then just thrown away and she is extremely bitter and what's interesting here is she does bear a strong resemblance to the character of Bertha in Jane Eyre and she sets a fire and even dances on the battlements just as happens in Bronte's novel. I don't know if there's any question of direct influence here. The next part is that Rich the Lionheart and Robin Hood and all his merry men lay siege to the castle. So we have this big 
explanation of what a siege would entail and they manage to liberate the captives except Yubeka is ridden away by de Gilbert to a Templar preceptory close by and here he deposits her and he begins trying to convince her that she should become his not through marriage but simply his concubine and Rebecca resists and just a little while later pure coincidence who should arrive but the Grand Master of the Order of the Templar Knights Beaumanoir and he is horrified to find out that within the walls there is this in his words Jewish sorceress who has bewitched a senior member of the order and he demands that there be a show trial of Rebecca for witchcraft and this forms another major set piece. This trial and the dialogue and events that surround it are beautifully rendered and along with the tournament it's probably the most successful part of the book. While this is going on where are the Saxons and Richard the Lionheart and Robin Hood? Well Athelstan appears to have died during the siege and so they have repaired to Cedric's castle and they're staging the funeral there of Athelstan and Richard the Lionheart wishes to attend for two reasons. Firstly he wants to demand that Cedric accept Ivanhoe as his rightful son once more and he also wants to forge bonds of unity between himself before he assumes the throne of England and the Saxons and to tell them he's going to treat them all equally. While the funeral is going on word arrives that Rebecca requires a champion to defend her otherwise she's going to be burnt at the stake and the person who will fight on behalf of the order is de Gilbert who's terribly conflicted about this so Ivanhoe rides away despite not having fully recovered from his wounds and Richard the Lionheart pursues him to York where the climax unfolds and that is all the action of the novel. Now let's tackle the weaknesses of Ivanhoe of which there are almost too many to document. The first of which is the siege sequence because here there is a problem that Scott has to solve. He has the characters separated in different parts of the castle and having different experiences at the same time. So what he does is with the first sequence he carries on in linear time and it ends with a blast on a horn outside the castle gates and then you have a flashback to another character's encounter. I think it's Isaac of York being tortured in a dungeon and that winds forward until again we get to the blast on the horn but this has to happen four or five times and it's just far too long. It's interminable and at one point Prince John is sat in York waiting for the Norman nobles to arrive and he makes the remark why is it taking so long and it's just what the reader is thinking too. These characters should have been here about 150 pages ago. It's one of those great moments in a book where a character's utterance not only has a meaning inside the world of the novel but also seems to be a comment upon the work itself. There's an utterance of a similar nature made by Ivanhoe during the siege when he wants to look out of the window and see what's happening but he's just too weak and he says to Rebecca I can't do anything and you're thinking yes what a strange book this is you are the hero and for 80% of it you're just lying on a litter moaning and receiving medicine from Rebecca you're only active at the tournament and at the conclusion I was reading this book while suffering from COVID-19 and I was consoling myself by thinking I can still do more than poor Ivanhoe so that is also a major problem in this novel. How can you have a situation where the hero is rendered inactive for such a large portion of the text? Another issue was the extremely flat characters. Again you could point to Ivanhoe here but also King Richard and Lady Rowena and the Norman nobles with the exception of de Gilbert are incredibly flat and that also had a 
hugely detrimental effect on the reading experience. One final weakness I must mention is that there is just far too much incident in this novel. And I'll give you an example. There is an entire chapter where Richard the Lionheart encounters Friar Tuck and they eat together and drink together and get rip-roaringly drunk. And then they begin singing these very boring songs. And this chapter adds nothing at all to the main lines of the narrative. And much of the novel is like this. There is just too much happening. There's really so much that could have been cut out. So those are the weaknesses of Ivanhoe. Let's turn to its strengths. Now, I've already mentioned two of the set pieces that are very successful, the tournament and the trial of Rebecca. The other thing I would pick out as a strength is the character of Rebecca. And actually, I would rename Ivanhoe Rebecca because she's the most fascinating and well-developed character in the entire book. Scott excels at creating strong female characters. And what Rebecca offers is an alternative to the chivalric code by which both the Saxons and the Normans live. Whereas they celebrate martial valour, she abhors the shedding of blood and she employs the healing arts on anyone, regardless of religion, regardless of whether they are wealthy or poor. And in her preparedness to die rather than to submit to de Gilbert, she shows incredible strength. And during the trial scene, she conducts herself with amazing dignity, just as she walks to the stake, knowing that she may have to die. And she's quite happy to pay this price. She belongs to a persecuted people. And she is truly the most stirring character in the novel. And there's also the fact that she falls in love with Ivanhoe. And yet it's impossible to be with him because he's already pledged to Lady Rowena and there's this very sad scene of her leave taking at the climax where she goes to Rowena and says please give my thanks to Ivanhoe my debt of gratitude and Rowena says oh you're leaving York and she says I'm leaving England me and my father are going to go to Spain so Rebecca is one of the reasons to read this book. Before I conclude this review I just want to throw in something rather different and that is the fact that as part of my preparation for making this video I went and watched the 1982 movie adaptation of Ivanhoe and I wanted to see how the director addressed some of these flaws that I'd identified and actually their decisions were very much in keeping with my own judgment. They largely dispensed, for example, with Robin Hood and they greatly shortened the scenes inside the castle and most interestingly of all the best performance in the movie was Rebecca by Olivia Hussey. She was extremely impressive and she captures the movie. Ivanhoe and Rowena and King Richard remain rather flat but I would say actually I got more enjoyment from watching this two and a half hour film than I did from reading the 500 pages or so of Ivanhoe. I know it's kind of heresy on booktube to recommend a movie over a text, but before you pick up Ivanhoe, you might wish to go and just check out that movie first and then you can see for yourself which you enjoyed more. I think I've said enough, so I'm just going to wrap up by repeating my mantra, be safe, be strong, and I shall see you anon. Nanu, nanu.